Well, first we have to check on the chicks, then we can go ramp hunting. Chicks are our priority. You heard the chickens? What do you want to do? We're not going on a bear hunt, we're going on a ramp hunt. But first, let's go check on the chickens. Good morning. We desperately need water, so let's start with that. You're gonna hold this up for me. Mom. The plan today is to get our chicks taken care of AM chores done, and then we are going to go out and forage for some wild ramps. <coughs> Chicks are looking really good. What I'm looking for today is everybody is lively. I don't want to see anybody lethargic. <coughs> Eating, drinking, under the lights, a little bit of everything is good. If they're all huddled under the lights, that's a bad sign. They're too cold. If they're all avoiding the lights, they're too warm. Yeah, these guys drink a lot more than chicks I, other chicks I've ever had, I really think. So I'm still giving them the traditional chick waterers right now just to make sure they're getting that. I really only believe in stressing them with one. I really only believe in stressing them with one task every week and this week their task is to keep warm it's a little cooler than I like out here but they're doing really well with it I have started them on chicken nipple and I can tell that they drank some of it but they have not drank all of it I think if they all knew what they were doing these would be completely empty this is what a healthy chick should look like totally warm and he is lively, not loving that I'm holding him. He's peeping at me a little bit. Eyes are open and clear. Um, this is really important. His little butt is completely clear. Sometimes they get something called pasty butt. You have to watch for that. Where essentially poop gets caked over the back of their vent. And uh, that will kill chicks. So you do have to watch for that and wash them off and dry them if you do see it start to happen. Salmonella, I know, but he's too cute not to kiss. I know. You were the unlucky one. All right. I do see that I do have one chick. Um, it's not looking so good. Let's see where he is. Right here. Okay. Holy macaroni. Okay. So here is an example of how you do not want your chick to look. All right. A little lethargic, a little flat, a little stiff. That's a bad sign. So that's a chick that did not make it. Out of 100 chicks, I've lost one. That's pretty amazing. Um, not uncommon to lose, you know, I would say even up to like 5% is really not uncommon, especially for them not being hatched here on our farm. That traveling is stressful and who knows if he could have had any problems. So we will bring him out and give him the burial in the woods. You can look at him, but don't touch him. Okay, you can pet him, but don't pick him up. How about that? Go. Okay, their lights are on and working. They've got fresh food, they've got fresh water. Everybody looks good. You wanna reach the dead chick? Yeah. All right, you can pet the dead chick here. See, this has to be over here because I have to be able to open this. This one. Well, good morning. Don't get any ideas about jumping out. I could use a resident mama in here. The little Sarama flock is doing really, really well. Okay. What do you want to do? Okay, screw the top on. You screw it on. You're doing it. There you. Go. Okay, it's on. Now we've got to do the quick flip. Ready? One, two, three. There we go. He 
These guys still don't appear. You're gonna help me shut the door. These guys don't appear to have figured out the chicken nipple yet. I'm hoping that's not a sign for how smart this breed is. We wanted to put the... You, I know you wanted to. We gotta get the chick. Alright. Here, someone's gonna have to be in charge of the chick. And then I'll let you shut this door. Here, he can't go in the house. He's gotta get out of there. You don't wanna leave a dead chick in with the other chicks. Alright. So now we're gonna cover up their holes so they don't escape, right? You okay? All right. Okay, let's get our hands washed. <clears throat> so we try to kind of watch where we're stepping, guys. Welcome to our secret ramp patch. I say secret because you need to be really careful when it comes to harvesting your ramps. Well, not really your ramps. I don't think ramps belong to anyone. Ah, uh, they're wild. <laughs> and um, many people do not harvest them sustainably. So they'll come out foraging and they'll take the entire patch and dig up the bulbs and sell them. Um, they go for a lot of money but the downside is <clears throat> they do not reproduce very quickly, um, if at all, if you take them all. I think it takes a ramp something like seven years before it'll start reestablishing itself. So you wanna be really careful. Now, there's a lot of ramp lookalikes in the spring. So you wanna make sure that you actually are harvesting a ramp. And you know it's a ramp if it has a green top like this and a red middle and then the bulb is actually white many people harvest the bulb i do not i will just take a leaf from several different plants and leave the bulb there i don't need the bulb to do the kind of cooking and and preserving that i'm going to do so i'm going to leave them there i don't know how long this patch has been here probably hundreds of years and i don't want to be the one responsible for it not coming back next year so let's take a look. Another way you can be sure you have a ramp is by actually smelling them. So a ramp is gonna smell like you're sticking your nose in a head of garlic. Hucky, come here once. Smell that. What do you think that smells like? Garlic. Garlic, yeah. So I'm gonna give you a pair of scissors. And I'll show you what to do, Huck. And you're going to hold the bowl for us. Can you come stand right here? Okay. You come stand right here. And you're going to hold the bowl. And Hucky and I will bring you leaves. So, Huck, just one leaf off of each plant. And only choose the bigger plants, too. Don't do the little tiny ones. And uh, try to cut it down low, okay? So that you're getting the whole leaf or a lot of it. And then the way I'm going to use these two things I'm gonna do. Um, one is going to be, I'm going to make a compound butter with them. So you're mixing butter with an herb. Um, and then you're putting it on top of something like potatoes or on top of steak, something like that. Another way that I'm gonna try this year that I never did, what Wilder, what? You need scissors? Yeah, Yeah, you can have these. Another um, thing I'm gonna try this year that I have not done before is dehydrating them. And then I have a powder. Ramp season is super short, couple of weeks long, that's it, and then they're gone for the year. So I want to try to find a way to preserve them as long as possible and be able to use them throughout the year. Yeah, and I feel like a powder could be used like um, if you were baking potatoes um, on a sheet pan or something like that, you could probably sprinkle them over much like you would like a ranch, a dry ranch mix or some other seasoning. So anyway, that's the game plan this year. Lots of different look-alikes. Some people get confused by this guy. A similar shaped leaf, but he has all these little spots on him. I think that's called a trout lily or something like that. Also, lily of the valley is commonly confused, but lily of the valley will not smell like garlic. Here, Wilder, what do you want? Yeah, you can use those scissors. 
Wild or, or Hucky, can you let him take those scissors and I'll I'll use these. Fuck. I'm just taking one leaf off of every plant here. Not even every plant. Only really the larger ones. And I thought about trying to bring some of these home and, and transplant them and grow them in my own yard, but as bad as I am with plants sometimes, it seems like it would be better to let nature raise these guys. Obviously, they're doing well out here. And I probably would not do as good of a job. They're also known to be difficult to transplant. And I don't have anywhere on my yard that has a similar system here. They have a lot of trees growing above them. Um, they're pretty shady. And that's not something I can recreate at my house. It takes some extra time to pull only one leaf off at a time, but we did really well. We have quite a few different individual leaves and we'll be bringing them home, washing them a little bit. Not really too worried about um, washing something that's just been in the woods. And then we'll be dehydrating some and cutting some up and putting them in a little bit of compound butter, which can be stored in the freezer. He's having a problem. What's the matter? We weren't going on a bear hunt. We were going on a ramp hunt. Well, we don't have a license to shoot a bear. And we don't really have any bears. And I don't really like bear meat. Well, because we can't go bear hunting. We were going ramp hunting. And we got our ramps. You did good. You got a lot of them. We can't go on a bear hunt. It was a ramp hunt. With some of the fresh ramps that we foraged for this morning, I'm gonna make an omelet, a ramp and asparagus and mozzarella cheese omelet. What's wrong, hot? Blow on it. Need help? Some is asparagus and some is ramp. So we're just laying out our ramp leaves onto the dehydrator sheets. Yep, they should just be a single layer, single leaf. While I was in the dehydrator, I found this. <laughs> Gives me forgot about this batch. The dog will be happy. ramps are in the dehydrator. I am getting ready to leave to pick up some grape vines from somebody who's willing to give me some little cuttings or I'm not sure what they are. But anyway, we're getting ready to leave to pick them up so we will get started on our Saturday home blessing. I just came home from a little road trip and was so happy when Huck came running up to me to show me what he got today. This is one Cerama chicken egg. I picked up five Cerama chickens, three roosters, and two hens about a week and a half ago, and one of the hens was mature and she was laying every single day for Linda, the chicken lady. When I got her home, she stopped laying. That is not uncommon for a chicken until they're settled into their surroundings. Lots of times they will not start laying again. So this tells me that she is not super stressed and that I will be getting one Cerama chicken egg every day and then when my other hen matures I will be getting an egg from her as well. 
My plan with these eggs, because my flock is only five big, is to incubate them. I do not have a broody chicken right now. Um, if I did, I would consider using that, but what I'm going to do is, starting tomorrow, I will collect these ceramic chicken eggs for between 10 and 14 days. Any longer than 14 days, and your eggs really will not be as fertile. Some people say even 10 days is already pushing it. Ceramas do not have a great hatch rate, a little bit lower than some of the other chickens, not as easy to hatch, not good for first time hatchers. Um, I have some experience with an incubator, so we are gonna give it a try and see if we can't put our flock growth on the fast track and get some more chicks as soon as possible. So very exciting, one Ceramic chicken egg. I just returned from a little road trip where I traded some current cuttings, a black and a red current cutting, for some red raspberries and for some grapevines. Neither variety uh, we knew the name of, but both of them had come with the house. So they were an old variety and have obviously lived for years with probably little to no maintenance or care. So we are going to go ahead and get these raspberries in the ground before it starts to rain. These ones are already starting to bud out a little bit and get some leaves on them, so I don't, I don't know if I should have cut them shorter or left them this tall. I'm gonna try leaving them this tall and we'll see. That may prove to be a mistake, but we'll try it. All I'm really doing for the hole on these is cutting a slit in the ground with my shovel and rocking back and forth a little bit. It'll save me a little bit of time and effort and I think since I'm going to mulch heavily with straw around these that I'm going to be okay to not, I think I'm going to be okay to not actually dig a whole hole. These were just two canes. I'm certain that this will not work, but I just wanted to prove to myself that it would not work. I'm just going to stick them in the ground. They have no roots on them right now. I'm assuming that that is not allowed and that won't work, but you know, when you get something for little to no investment, it's okay to experiment and try things that might prove to save you a whole lot of time and energy. So let's just see what happens. These were two of the nicest women that I picked these up from and they were super thankful to have my current cuttings. And while I was there, I noticed they had a sink, a sink that I've been looking for. It's an old cast iron farmhouse sink with a porcelain coating on it. And my hope is that I can install one of these sinks outside of my greenhouse or near my greenhouse and be able to wash vegetables and dirty hands and things before I go into the house. And it just so happened that she had one sitting in her yard that maybe she had ripped out of her old farmhouse. And I asked her about it and she totally let me have it for free. So I was very excited about that. I have that in the back of my van. I have yet to tell Scott that he's got to lug that thing out of my van and install it. <laughs> but he's usually pretty willing to go along with my vision. So anyway, soon I will have that. I won't say soon. At some point, I will have an outdoor sink, which is something I've always wanted so that I don't have to bring hands like this into my kitchen sink. This is the perfect time to get these in the ground because there's definitely rain coming this afternoon. And even though you can water plants, and I always water mine in, there's something magical about rain. It does a better job of watering than anything you could ever do. This guy looks good and he has a lot of little babies right around the base. So that's exciting. Nice fat earthworm. They're everywhere around here, which I think is a good sign of healthy soil. 
So this is the way the permaculture orchard works. You can see in this line of trees here, we have a cherry tree here, and then just to the left over here, we'll have another kind of tree. It will not be a cherry. It'll be a plum or a pear or an apple. This orchard has trees in rows, but the pattern we use typically is NAP, N-A-P. So N stands for nitrogen mixer, A stands for apple, and P stands for pear, plum, cherry, anything like that. You don't have to get stuck on the exact pattern. The important thing is that you're not planting the same tree next to each other. If I had an entire row of apple trees, an apple tree pest could hop from tree to tree to tree to tree and just completely wipe me out. It also isn't as good for my pollinators. All of those apple trees will be um, blooming at the same time, and while my bees will get a bunch of pollen at that time, they could be starving very shortly thereafter. The next principle of our permaculture orchard is the perennials. So in between all of the trees, we have perennials planted. Um, so for example, a raspberry is a nice example of a perennial here in Wisconsin. It will come back year after year after year. I don't have to plant it. It'll take care of itself, it will reproduce itself, and give some diversity to our orchard. So it brings in different birds, which are great for pests. It provides um, food for our pollinators at different times than what our trees will. And it brings that biodiversity to the orchard, which is what we're really looking for. Um, in addition to the small perennials like the raspberries, we also have larger, more like shrubs. Um, so for example, we have American hazelnut planted in here. We have currant bushes out here, and we're gonna continue to plant more of those. Um, some grapes. When we have the tree pattern, the nitrogen fixer, the apple, the pear, and the plum, you can find a nitrogen fixer for any zone that you live in. The one that we primarily use here is a honey locust. So I've ordered some thornless honey locusts. The wild honey locusts around here have thorns on them. I'm actually okay with either either or. So I have about half of my nitrogen fixers that are honey locust and a, the thornless variety, and about half of them are honey locust, but the wild thorn variety because they kept coming up in my garden. So I just marked them and we planted them this last fall. So what purpose do nitrogen fixers serve for our orchard? The nitrogen fixers provide long-term fertilization for our orchard and will prevent us from having to come back in and fertilize. Also, we'll use those nitrogen fixers as they get bigger as trellises. So maybe I wouldn't want a grapevine to climb up my apple tree or my pear tree, but I don't mind if a grapevine climbs up my nitrogen fixers. All right, they also, the honey locusts are a great choice for our nitrogen fixers because they're very tall and fast growing, but the light is still able to filter through their leaves. They do not create a great deal of shade. So that's an important feature when you're looking at your nitrogen fixers. I want this to serve as evidence that guineas can be lovely birds. I'm not doing anything alarming, nothing unusual, so they're not yelling at all of us. Now if I were to say, whip out an umbrella, or there's a cat behind us that's walking up, um, that'll probably cause some screaming, some alert. If the UPS van pulls in, we're gonna have to scream. But there are a lot of times when they're very, very peaceful like this. Tallulah, don't you get them going. All right. Last red raspberry going in the ground. And this was nice. Six hours ago, these were in the ground at Sarah's place. Now <laughs> they're in the ground at my place. They didn't have to be shipped anywhere. They didn't have to sit out for a couple of days. They got to go right back in, which is great. Raspberries in the ground. Let's take a look at the ones we planted the other day. These are some of the yellow raspberries, I think. Yes, these are my Kinsman yellow raspberries. Um, 
and I can see they're doing really well. The ground is still really moist around them. That's thanks to our mulch that we put in place and our tarp. But they also, this is very exciting to see, they have little green buds on them. So this thing is gonna leaf out here in the next week and probably take off. Wonderful to see. Same thing here, looking great, already has one bud. So that is promising. <clears throat> but take a look at the red raspberries I planted. I wasn't as hopeful about those ones. They were in a little bit rougher shape. And as I tried to trim them down, I had a hard time getting to green wood. Most of it was still pretty brown. I don't know about those guys, how they're gonna do. Papa. What is he doing, Peter? Why is she climbing down? Gosh, he knows how to make me nervous. Let me see if I can help him. We're gonna take just a minute and look and see if we can plant grapes in the ground with vines this long, or if it's best practice to prune them before I put them in the ground. I like your seesaw you built. Very creative, you two. So these are the grapevines that we got. I just read about transplanting grapes and it sounds like best practice is to trim this down. Now it's set to a couple of buds. I guess, I don't know if those are considered buds, probably not, but anyway, I am going to trim it down. I asked someone to bring me my pruners. They brought me the, I don't know, some kind of tool for cutting wire. I'm going with it because it's what I got. Okay, now I have something a little bit more manageable to work with. So let's head out and see what we can do. I swear we live on the windiest farm in all of Wisconsin. We've got our new wind guard on the microphone. I'm hoping it's helping some. Does she need help down? Even though this looks like it would go straight up, there are roots over here. So I'm thinking I'll try to plant it in the way it was originally planted. Maybe some people would just cut it off, but I don't know. We'll go with this and see what happens. Is that how it was planted? Like, I think it was going like this. Yeah. What's that branch right there? <laughs> I don't know. That's another, it's kind of another piece. I don't know. But we'll try this and see. Raining, so I'm gonna see if I can get a little bit more work done.
On our project list today was to move the clothesline. So the downside is we have a couple of big holes in our yard to fill up. The plus side is I'm a little bit closer to having my clothesline back up and functional, which is very, very important to me, especially now that I need to reduce my electric bill as much as possible. So it's gonna be moving all the way to the backyard so that we have this area for gardening and greenhouse and keyhole garden and honeybees and all of those things. This thing is heavy. Gavin, accept some help, my brother. We're gonna go on the far side of the outhouse with it. You're amazing. I can't let you go to boot camp. You can do it, you can do it. But honestly, Gavin, two people can lift something together. To many of you, the sink probably looks like garbage. <laughs> and it probably is. There's a fine line between garbage and something Aaron collects. Um, but this is exactly what I was looking for for my outdoor garden sink. Something cast iron, porcelain coated, with a little bit of character built into it. I'll probably scrub off the blue spray paint, but I would most likely leave the rust marks on there. And this is gonna sit right outside of my greenhouse so that I can water plants or wash vegetables, um, maybe wash my hands before I go in the house, bathe the dog, something that I don't really wanna do in my own kitchen sink. So anyway, I was super excited to be able to have this gem for free. I can see the potential. And Scott can build me a wonderful stand for it. So anyway, that'll be a project we'll put on the list.